Hello, good citizens. My name is Dan. Welcome back to the Victoria Crown Prosecutor's Lies and Crime series. This is part five. So in part four, Lauren T. Phipps had personally fabricated evidence to be used against me and have me held in prison. In doing so, he intentionally misled this judge in part four. But he's not done yet. Mr. Kuzma is acting on my behalf as I'm convinced that when the judge hears the truth, I'll be released that day. Unfortunately, in speaking with Mr. Kuzma, I only got maybe five minutes with him, so he takes notes and does the best that he can. Mr. Phipps has had days to prepare for this, and Mr. Kuzma has only had a few minutes. I think Mr. Kuzma did the best that he could under the circumstances, but I think if I'm ever in this position again, I'll be doing the talking. Now, one thing I couldn't fit into part four was, I'm not sure who this judge is. The official court transcript says it's Judge Harvey. According to the provincial court website, Judge Harvey's first name is Brian. I'm assuming Judge Harvey is a man. However, myself and my supporters that were in court that day all remember this judge was a woman. So, uh, not really sure if this is actually Judge Harvey or not. But, anyways, here's part five. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Dan is years old, Your Honor. He's been in a common law relationship now for 13 years with Mrs. Silent. She's present and seated in the first row. Her father is also present seated beside her, Mr. Good Dad. He's been in custody now five days, Your Honor, as a result of this alleged incident. He wasn't able to have his bail hearing on Friday so remained in custody over the weekend and is now before the court. He has no record. With respect to these matters, Your Honor, the difficulty begins by virtue of the fact that when he received disclosure in December 2014, I believe it was the complainant's address was noted in the particulars, which is normally not the case. It's usually whited out. So he knew where the complainant lived but did nothing about that. He didn't go to his house and make a nuisance of himself. For many months things passed without incident. When the matter of the trial began, he is self-represented, and I'd ask your honor to keep that in mind and acknowledge that he is entitled to some latitude in how he's going to carry out his or conduct of the case. He ended up going over to the other place because he wanted to examine the location and various aspects to it because it goes to his defense he says. He says that at trial he went to cross examine the complainant and was told by the judge that that was not the appropriate thing. I believe Crown objected, Mr. Cheeseman, and it was upheld. But there were a series of questions on cross examination, and Dan was left with the impression that the complainant had moved. So this was a result of the first day of trial and the cross-examination that followed. So up until the first day of trial my client knew where the complainant lived. But never took any steps to bother him or his family. And he advises me that he has no idea who the fellow's wife or children are. But after cross-examination on the, he now has some information he thought about where the complainant resided or certainly that the complainant no longer resided there. So he wanted to go back and take some photos and film because it was part of his defense. And that may seem fanciful, but... No, it doesn't. It just seems a little coincidental that he would be filming Mr. Pooh's wife and children. How would I know what his wife and kids look like? The only reason why I know he has a wife and kids is because Mr. Pooh wrote detailed bogus statements to the police about his concerns for his safety and the safety of his wife and kids. Well, he advises me that he didn't know it was her or the children. He went back there on the, after court, after he was advised by the court that the matter wouldn't proceed that day. Ultimately, it was rescheduled for this Wednesday, so it's only two days down the road. And so after his appearance on the, and the cancellation on the second day of the trial, he went to this address that he now thought he was entitled to go to because the bail term said not to go where the complainant resided. Uh, that's incorrect. Uh, it actually said I was not to go where I knew he lived. Didn't say that. And as far as he knew, he didn't live there anymore. I haven't listened to Daz. I haven't had the opportunity to do that. My learned friend advises me that he listened to part of it, and I also spoke to Mr. Cheeseman who was Crown Counsel and he has a recollection of what happened. But my client says that's not his recollection. Mr. Cheeseman's recollection? What happened to your recollection, Mr. Cheeseman? It sounds like by having a different recollection that what actually happened on the record and what was said on the record, it would seem that you actually started the whole ball rolling 
with fabricating evidence, obstructing justice, and criminally harassing me. Clearly, Mr. Cheeseman lied about his recollection from the DARS the previous day, as everything I was saying was supported, not only by the DARS, but the court official transcripts. There's actually a lot more I want to say about Mr. Cheeseman, but uh, I'll hold off for when he uh, makes a comeback in part six. That he now felt he could go there and take some pictures in his self-defense, and that's the position that he's putting forward. So the matter will proceed again in two days, Your Honor, and I'm asking Your Honor to release him on his own recognizance. Now, in the event that Your Honor feels that that's not sufficient, his common-law spouse is prepared to act as surety in this matter, and it would be my submission that that would suffice in this case. She's a professional who has been employed for many, many years. She has advanced degrees and is about to start. So she's someone of good character, of no criminal record, and could come forward as a surety and she. We're talking about two days here, Your Honor. The trial will be continuing actually in less than two days. So I'm asking you to release him on a surety if necessary, and he'll proceed to trial on Wednesday and certainly the main matter, the substantive matter will be decided on that day. He has his views I've stated in part. His defense to the second series of charges that in effect he's saying that he was an innocent observer of the apartment in question and that will be for a court to decide at some point. But for now I'd ask, Your Honor to release him. I have two points I'd like to make in reply to my friend's submission. The first is I believe that the evidence from the trial so far gives good reason to doubt the version of events as alleged by the accused through counsel. The first is that as a practical matter, Dan believed that the trial would be continuing the following day. Here's another practical matter. Lauren, you just made that up to mislead this judge. Yeah, he says my story doesn't work out because I believe that the trial is continuing the next day. But according to the transcripts in part two, we talked to Judge Rogers for almost 10 minutes about how it wasn't continuing the following day. Judge Rogers even told me, I don't even need to bring anything except my calendar. And sure enough, according to the transcripts in part three, we all showed up the next day expecting to fix a continuation date and not expecting the trial to continue. This is the exact same lie that Lorne T. Phibbs fabricated and misled this judge in part four with, and now he's doing it again. Like, seriously, how is Mr. Phipps actually expecting to use this as evidence in a proposed criminal trial in the future? So if he had, if he wanted, if this is true and he wanted to further his defense, wouldn't he have gone the night before so he could have used that evidence in this trial? <laughs> he even calls me out on it and says, if this is true and he wanted to further his defense, he would have had to have gone the night before, so he could have used that evidence at trial. But that's not true, because I knew the trial was not continuing the next day. I still had potentially a week or a month. Regardless, I knew that trial was not continuing the following day. And it was only when he realized the trial was going to be adjourned that he goes immediately without picking up his court slip. Oh, when I found out the trial was not proceeding. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> Having been directed to do so, immediately to the residence of the complainant. And that's, as a matter of ordinary human experience, that's not consistent with wanting to prepare his defense, which he would have had to have done the night before. <laughs> so he says, I, I left the court hearing and I went immediately to uh, the residence of Mr. Pooh. Which is odd, because I was going home, and Mr. Pooh's building that he used to live at is only uh, half a block away from where I live. That is absolutely consistent with preparing for defense. I now knew, after walking out of that hearing, that I had a week. So now that he no longer lives there, what a great time to take the pictures. I'm right here. Why continue filming when this woman calls out to him and he responds impassively by continuing to film? Oh god, here we go with this BS again. Why not discontinue filming? Why not acknowledge her? Why continue to film her when she is going up the ramp of the carport? Again, never filmed her, never filmed her kids. How would I even know who they are if I've never seen them, I've never met them, I don't know them? How can I just walk out of a court hearing and uh, allegedly drive directly there and just show up and they just happen to be in the parkade and I just happen to be there to film them? It doesn't make any sense. I didn't even say anything to this broad. She just gave me attitude right off the bat. So I just ignored her. 
Can someone explain to me how I would know that this is Mr. Pooh's wife and kids? And how I could possibly just plan to walk out of a court hearing and just magically show up at the right time? These are all questions that remain unaddressed by the defense submissions. My second point is that the accused being in a reverse onus situation has to demonstrate how his release can be justified. That's a great question, uh, Lorne. How can I demonstrate my release should be justified when the prosecutor is literally fabricating almost everything that the judge is hearing? That's, yeah, good luck with that, eh? And, in my submission, this bail plan is essentially the same bail plan that he was on before. Because the couple having been in a common-law relationship for 13 years, the fact that there was a thousand-dollar recognizance that could be potentially be as treated would have presumably come from a shared life. It would have detracted from the shared life that they lived prior to this breach, and the fact that the couple jointly has now, as my friend suggests, a thousand-dollar recognizance and surety form still has the same effect on the couple's ultimate financial stake in the game and doesn't represent a new deterrent on the accused. So in the circumstances, it's my submission that that bail plan does not address the reverse onus considerations under 515 of the code and the accused should be detained. That's incorrect. And as you heard me say on the record there, uh, just sitting there, I'd finally had enough of the BS that was being said. And even though I'm not allowed to stand up or say anything, I put on the record when Mr. Phipps was finished, that's incorrect. I am going to detain the accused. I am concerned about his behavior and his continued filming of this particular family. Oh, damn. Wow. The judge just basically found me guilty right here and now. Oh, concerned about my behavior, about my continued filming of this particular family. I'm not sure how that... How did that get in there? Yeah, the judge just said I did it. So I guess I'm guilty now. So much for being presumed innocent. There is not any other purpose in doing it other than to intimidate. And when he was called upon because the person in family, he was a filming called out to him. He did not respond. He just went up and waited for them to come and continue to tape them. What purpose is that? And the judge is uh, sold by Mr. Fibbs fabricated evidence. Totally fooled. Yeah, they called out to me and I didn't respond and I waited for them to come up and continue to tape them. What purpose is that? Well, it never happened, actually. And to suggest that it is just a coincidence it was Mr. Pooh's family, that leaves me with a lot of concerns. No, I'm not suggesting it's a coincidence. I'm saying it's fabricated evidence. And that leaves you with a lot of concerns? Hmm. Me too. There is a trial proceeding, and the witnesses need to have the security of knowing that they are not likely to face this gentleman. Again before the case is completed at best, and perhaps, depending on what happens there, there may be other orders that have to be made. Oh, ouch. Ooh, that's a low blow. The judge says, quote, depending on what happens there, there may be other orders that have to be made, unquote. Oh, ouch. Guilty. Oh, presumed innocent? No, you've, already, you've done this. You're guilty. But this is simply unacceptable behavior. No, Judge, you know what's unacceptable behavior? Uh, prosecutors that uh, lie to mis intentionally mislead judges and fabricate evidence and obstruct justice and criminally harass people. And I cannot in good conscience. I do not know what terms to put on him. He is told not to go there. He goes there. I'm told not to go there. Then I go there. No, I was told I can't go where I know he lives. So, considering he testified in court that he no longer lives there, do I know where he lives? I just, I could not think of any other terms, so he is detained until trial is heard. So if it could be adjourned to Wednesday then? Return date is Wednesday. For that purpose, Your Honor, for an in-person appearance for the continuation of the trial, the, of August, I think it would be 9 o'clock in this courtroom. Just concurring with my friend, both files to that date? Yes, please. All right. Oh, great. I'm detained until the trial is heard. So, it's it's like I'm guilty. So, back to prison I go. Thanks for the bail hearing. And I'm now going to be held in prison with no criminal record until this matter has concluded. And that could take probably at least six months. 
So I'm now slowly realizing that within those six months, I could potentially lose my spouse. And I will probably lose where I live. And I will probably lose my job. And I will probably lose the car that I bought brand new and only had five payments left. And I will probably lose my pets. Well, I've got lots of time to think about this. And the charges that they've added and trumped up are so serious that we're now going to Supreme Court. Boy, I'm really learning how the justice system really works, aren't I? Well, as I'm carted back off to prison, I'm going to conclude part five here. If you think part four and five were bad, wait till you see part six. Thanks for watching.